This is Your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 83. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Well, welcome back and happy 2019. I am so thrilled to be here with you and spend some time with you. Oh my goodness, this year is going to be so exciting. We have some amazing guests on and today we're starting off with a huge bang. We have a very, very exciting guest on today, so I can't wait to get to that with you. But first, I want to give you a couple of really exciting announcements. Number one, and this is so exciting, I have been wanting to share with you about this for a quite a while. I am so honored to be invited to be one of the speakers at this year's OCD Game Changers event in Colorado, ran by Chrissy Hodges. I don't know if any of you know her. I'm sure you do. She's been on the podcast before. You can follow her on social media. She's pure O Chrissy, I think it is. I'll have a link in the show notes. But Chrissy Hodges is just doing some amazing work and she has invited me to speak. And I can't tell you how excited I am to go to Denver and to speak with some amazing speakers. Stuart Ralph from OCD Stories will be there. Stephen Smith from No CD will be there. Ethan Smith, who's been on the podcast, will be there. Margaret Sisson and Chris Tronsden. It's going to be an amazing event. So if you're interested, please do go over to Chrissy Hodges' website. I'll link it in the show notes and you can find out more information. It's on March 2nd. And I think last year she actually streamed it live. So even if you can't get to the event, check it out with her. But I think that you can maybe listen in or at least buy the video afterwards. So super excited about that. And then number two, something that I am pretty much can barely hold my stuff together is my most exciting news, which is ERP School, the online course for OCD using exposure and response prevention, will be back on January 31st, 2019. So if you didn't get it last year, you missed out, that's totally okay. We're going to keep offering it but we are going to re-release it on January 31st. It'll be available for two weeks, and then we're going to close card again. We're only doing this short period because I really get exhausted with selling. (laughs) It's not my best suit. So it'll be open for two weeks. Once you buy it, you have unlimited access. You'll have access to every time I update it, which I have updated it since last time. I've taken, you know, the few comments that I got that were saying they felt it needed to be, you know, tweaked here and there. And I changed those things and made it better and added some extra stuff. So I am so, so thrilled. Now, leading up to that, I am going to again do the free training, the 10 things you need to know about OCD. So if you didn't get to see that last year, this is going to be another opportunity for you to see that free training. It will be available on January 24th. You can go to cbtschool.com to get all the information, sign up for it. And we will be launching on January 24th with that free training. So, so much exciting stuff happening in the new year. I just want to get straight into work and make it a really great year and hopefully help all of you guys and give you guys extra tools to help you learn how to stare fear back in the face and not let fear make your decisions because that's what this is all about. That's what CBT school is all about. That's what this podcast is all about. That's what I'm all about. And so I'm so deeply excited about that. 
So let's get straight to the episode. I know that's why you're here and I feel like I need another drum roll because today I have the amazing Stephen Hayes. Now, Stephen Hayes has written many, many books and many, many articles and many, many research papers, but I have to say I am probably the number one fan of his book, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life. This book changed me. I was encouraged to read it by a professor in my first quarter of my master's degree when I was training to become a therapist. And oh my stars, you guys, this just shifted things for me and it felt right to me. And I am such a huge advocate for the work that Stephen does, specifically in the area of acceptance and commitment therapy. So I'm going to take you straight to this episode, but I wanted just to let you guys know, we cover a lot about ACT. We talk a lot about values and how we can make our values a part of our treatment. One thing I really loved hearing is he talked about why our thoughts are so linked and why we have these strange thoughts sometimes when they come out of the blue and they're absolutely like not really related to what's going on. And he talks a lot about that. And I think that you guys will really find that beneficial to understand the process in our brains that causes that. Because Stephen Hayes, you guys, is just a genius at this stuff. He's so good and so down to earth and such a good guy. So as you can tell, I'm jumping off the walls a little excited. (laughs) Can you tell? Just a little bit excited. (laughs) But anyway, I'm going to take you straight to the show. Have a wonderful day. Please know that I'm sending you such healing vibes right now. And I believe in you. I know you can do these hard things. And so let's go into 2019 together, holding hands. Have a wonderful day. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. I am doing a little bit of a dance inside, just in excitement to have Stephen Hayes with me here today. So welcome. I'm so grateful to have you here and share your wonderful knowledge with us. And I have... I have some questions, but I'm kind of just want to free flow this. So what I really would love to get from today is to really encapsulate the brilliance of your work. I use it in my office all the time, but really to look at the four people who maybe don't know much about it, to give them a little first rundown on what is ACT and what are the main points they would need to know. Great. Happy to do that. And I'm, I know you work in particular with uh, anxiety and, uh, you know, I have a history of that with myself. So I, I have heart for it and I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. Uh, ACT is not a brand new thing, but it's new to a lot of people. It's uh, an attempt to bring acceptance and mindfulness methods and commitment behavior change methods together for the purpose of producing what we call psychological flexibility which is a a set of skills that people can learn that predicts more about how anxiety, depression, substance use, et cetera, will unfold than any other set, arguably. It has a lot of evidence behind it, about a thousand studies. If you summarize it all and if you expand to include, you know, some of the basic analysis of how your mind works and how emotions work and so forth, you get up around 2000 studies. So it's sitting on top of a 30, 35 year old tradition. But, you know, with the arrival of the mindfulness based uh, methods, you know, a lot of people have been exposed to that. What's a little different about ACT is that it's been following a Western science approach. And so while it's respectful and connected to the wisdom traditions, the mindfulness traditions, it's done kind of a bottom up analysis. We can say why the mind gets in the way and in some ways that brings, I think, some new things to it. So by acceptance and mindfulness, we mean this constellation of skills of being emotionally and cognitively open, being able to come into the present moment in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary, rather than kind of being fixed at what's in the past or worried about what's in the future. Not that worry has a place, and even rumination has a place, but when it's involuntary, when you're being pulled to the past or future, We want to teach skills that allow people to allocate their attention in the now to what is of importance and to do that consciously from this uh, 
more observing or spiritual or witnessing sense of self, this uh, kind of person behind the eyes sense of self. Mm. That's the acceptance of mindfulness piece. And it lines up with what people have defined as mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn and others. But in an ACT model, it adds a little bit bit of this issue of self. But then the purpose of all that is so that you can direct your attention towards what brings meaning and purpose to you in, in your life instead of putting your life on hold while you fight a war within. So, well, what would happen if you started living right now? And what would the qualities of your life, what kind of qualities of being and doing would you want to put there? And then then we kind of turn into you know, more like a behavior therapists, frankly, because we know a lot about how to build skills once you get a focus on what it is that you want to build. And to do that in a way that's respectful of how habit change works, how behavior change works, that's sort of small, incremental, but constant and building through practice and and larger patterns, kind of habits of values-based action. So even when you're not watching, your life is still moving forward because you can kind of groove yourself to be moving in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Those are the commitment behavior change processes. So psychological flexibility is all those things working together. And that's what we're trying to produce from acceptance and commitment therapy point of view. And when you learn the skills and you, you know, it's not so much learning the lingo and the concepts, but the skills themselves, you'll see that they're all around you all the time. They're in your uh, uh, self-help traditions, but they're also in your wisdom traditions, but they're also in art and literature and, and frankly, uh, in your uh, cultural traditions. It's not like we don't have a lot of wisdom that we can draw on. But if you just let the mind do what it normally does, it's going to judge, cajole, criticize, aggrandize, deflect, avoid, distract. And next thing you know, you're in a cul-de-sac. You don't know how you got there. And, uh, you know, anxiety disorders, anxiety struggles. There's right. some things to learn, but it's pretty much a cul-de-sac. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, we think we have uh, some methods that are really help people uh, if they're tired of living at, at a dead end road to turn around and head in a different direction. Hmm. I love that you bring that up so quick because it's actually one of the things I've been so eager to ask you, which is, in your opinion, why does our mind do what it does? It's really an evolutionary mismatch. We didn't evolve for peace of mind. That's not how it happened. What's happening is that a mode of mind that's only a couple hundred thousand years old or a couple million years old, nothing, if you sort of think about things in the grand scheme of things, is clashing up with learning processes that are half a billion years old. I mean, what the learning processes do, you know, they're designed, as the, the phrase goes, to uh, yeah, skip uh, eating lunch in the service of avoiding being lunch. I mean, you we have learned to be able to transfer our past experience into the present moment, especially around things that are aversive and scary, but also positive things through direct association and contingencies through learning of operant and classical conditioning, social learning, imitation. And those are ancient. There's some that are even more ancient, habituation, for example, and add another hundred million years, but it's half a billion years old. So we are really good at not just, automatically withdrawing your hand from pain or something like that, but reacting to things that would predict that. Mm. You know, if the rustling of the leaves predict the arrival of a predator, you're running before you even know what happened. And and you want to because your survival depends on it. Mm. Now, here comes this new kid on the block, what you and I are doing right now, of symbolic uh, learning. That's not what the bird is doing outside the window. I mean, the way that you know, written language is only about 5,000 years old. The symbolic language is, you know, maybe the hominins did it, but if it's Homo sapiens forward, that's a, you know, a few hundred thousand years. That's no time at all. So we can take things that are, quote, just in our mind, meaning they're in our symbolic processes of being able to imagine futures that have never been, for example, and react to it as if there's the rustling of the leaves that predicts the predator is about to eat us. And You take something like you have a really scary talk coming up. It's not here yet. You may not have had any real troubles in the past, even with talks, but you're afraid of this one. And you're imagining what will happen if this happens and that happens and that happens. Well, you're learning 
I mean, you are using something that is very recent and it's now digging into parts of your brain that are at the level of alligators, you know, uh, mm -hmm. thrashing against enemies or something. And next, you know, your heart's beating differently. You're starting to sweat. You're all emotionally aroused and you're avoiding what? A danger you've experienced? Maybe not. A danger that's actually going to here and going to happen? Maybe not. Maybe it's nothing more than this relatively recent uh, ability to, through symbolic processes, produce an imaginary universe that um, includes fear. Well, we're not going to take that away because it also allows us to produce imaginary universes in which we have iPhones when we don't have them or you know, send people to the moon or you know, grow crops uh, more than you used to be able to, or on, 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 on. So it, it's sitting right atop the most important, wonderful achievements of art and literature and science and technology. And it's the very same thing that allows us to do what no other creature on the planet can do, which is to have everything and still be miserable. I mean, to have mm -hmm. people who love you and be able to eat and keep the rain off you and being warm and you're you're thinking about how can I go through another day? There's no other creature on the planet, none for which that's true. Mm. In order to make a dog afraid, you got to have really, you got to kick it or whack it or hurt it or you can't just talk to it, but you can do that with a person. And yeah. so, you know, we, and now that is not new, of course, that's the human condition. But what is new? is through the very products of science and technology produced by this wonderful, terrible, brilliant, awful <laughs> repertoire of being able to think and reason symbolically. We've now created a modern world in which, for example, you can be exposed to horror 24-7 live. You can see things happen. And, you know, the culture has moved. When I was a kid, I'm old enough, I'm, I'm just turning 71 next year. When soldiers were shot in the Vietnam War, you couldn't print pictures of them in the newspaper. Think about that. It would be like a scandal. You can go up and actually see people drowning, shot, tortured, live, or within minutes. All you need is a screen. And everybody's got, within arm's reach, they got a screen. And with a few steps, probably two or three, and if you wander your house, four, five, or six, so you've got a constant exposure to horror. We now have constant exposure to judgment through social media and so forth of, you know, criticism, shame and blame. You just turn on your favorite newscast, watch it for about five minutes from right now, and you tell me if it's not full of judgment. Yeah. And then we're able to compare ourselves to others. I saw a, a little photo of a an aboriginal person in Australia sitting under a one of those uh, trees they got, I forgot the name of it, the one the kookaburras sit in, gum gum trees. Yeah, yeah. Well, Australian. not the eucalyptus, but the one that kind of spread out. And he has a didgeridoo there, and he's got a loincloth, and he's tapping something into his iPhone. You know, you want to look at Donald Trump's bathroom? You want to see what gold-plated uh, doorknobs look like? You can do it. So now, what do we know about how to make human beings miserable? Well, I just mentioned the big three, expose them to horror, mm. expose them to judgment, and expose them to comparison in which they're not doing as well as somebody else. That is our daily diet. Mm. And even 20 years ago or 10 years ago, that wasn't true in the same way. So, you know, the young people listening to this right now, the people who are in that 18 to 24 range, their anxiety is a standard deviation worse than it was 30 years ago mm. among people in the same age bracket. And we know it's not just self-report. It's not that people are whining or complaining because it shows up in things like suicide rates and addiction rates and things that are, you know, eating disorders. You've got an online, you know, things that are real, undeniable, not just telling the story. It's not that you're complaining. It's harder mm. to be human now. And so it's no wonder that the mindfulness traditions have exploded because we need some kind of modern minds for this modern world we've created. And um, I think that's what we're trying to do in the evidence-based therapies and figure out a way to do it that you can give away to normal people, that you don't have to necessarily go and 
have 12 sessions that you probably can't afford or whatever. I mean, that's fine. That's good. That's great. And I'm glad it's there. You do that kind of work. I do too. But everybody is struggling. If you know anybody really well and you talk to them in some depth, if it's not them, it's their spouse or their one of their kids or somebody in their family. And I think it's just because we've turned things into the loose into the world that we can't stop. We wouldn't want to. And we have to adjust to it psychologically. It is a more demanding world that we've created, a more wonderful world in many ways. You can talk to somebody around the world, anybody, you know, you can see things, you, you know, cultures mix, but then all of those things are challenges too. So I think that's what, what we're doing here. So tell me if you are willing how you used or how you trial and error or came up with these tools. So to have the story of origin of act, is that what you're asking? Oh, well, what I would really love is to get some really in detail, like how, how skills, like how do you practice oh, sure. and, and how do you be present how do you well, line up with your values? We can walk through those one at a time. I mean, and they're, these are skills that can be learned. One of the things that's exciting about it is psychological flexibility is not like some personality thing that you just get stuck on you, like a red mark. It's never going to be rushed, you know, like you're neurotic or you're right. you got this personality disorder or that. No, psychological flexibility is not a, a trait. It's a set of skills and you can change them. And these trajectories, we've followed them out now five, 10 years in trials of two, three, four, 10,000 people. So we know how these trajectories work out. If you're psychologically inflexible, everything is going to go worse. I saw a study just this morning with uh, war vets returning who've been exposed to horror. We'd ask our soldiers to go out and do these things. And there it is, you know, they put in neuroticism, they put in resilience, that what predicted over a year's time, who's going to develop PTSD of psychological inflexibility. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you can learn them and that they're a set of skills is what really makes them exciting. There's six. I've already mentioned them, but I get, didn't tag them. Emotional openness, we tag, we call it acceptance, not meaning tolerance or resignation, but in the original sense of the term, like when you give a gift to somebody and say, would you accept this? You mean Am I willingly going to take what's of use here in this moment in, from my emotional life? In the area of cognition, the key process we call diffusion. That's a made-up word. It's not diffusion. It's defusion. Uh, the early word was deliteralization, and I could never figure out how to say that. So we made up. <laughs> but it just means... The fuse means to pour together, like, you know, the fusion that happens with lemonade, you know, the different things come together, one thing. And when your mind gets going and you're not watching it, when you just look at the world that's structured by it, it pours your evaluation, predictions, fears, interpretations. It pours verbal, symbolic meaning into the actual events. And so when th something happens, it, it isn't just that you're evaluating it as terrible or good. It, it is terrible or good, et cetera. So cognitive diffusion. Flexible attention than now I mentioned from this transcendent or observer sense of self I mentioned. Uh, meaning and purpose, we'll just call that values and uh, building habits of that, we'll call it committed action. So those are the six. Some of the, by knowing what the processes are, and there are six, but they all go together, like six sides of a box. You wouldn't assemble a box, put one side down there and, and know if, you, if nobody had told you that it was the side of a box, it would just look like a square. But when you put it all together, then it's something more than just the elements. And psychological flexibility is like that. It's six things put together as really one thing. But since we know what the processes are, we have some methods to move them. And some of them are kind of odd. And not odd because we're trying to be odd, but just because when the uncommon sense of science gets in the room, you're able to add something to what the culture already has. So let me take the example of diffusion. Diffusion is to disrupt the normal structure of language that allows symbolic processes to disappear as something you're doing and instead only present you with the world that's structured by those processes. So, for example, if I were to say the word milk right now, you could probably taste it. You could imagine what it would feel like to drink cold milk. 
you could picture it if you closed your eyes. You could almost hear it as they have pouring it in a glass or what would it sound like to what would it feel like to you know guzzle down a glass of milk? Well, there's no milk around. I mean, very few listeners have milk within arm's reach. But they're probably salivating a little more than they were before. If you had cotton in your mouth, just by talking about it, you probably did imagine a few of the things I said. It didn't push you very hard to do it. If I'd done it, anybody could do it. it. It's just automatic, right? Well, that's a good thing because it allows you to use this evolutionarily new process of symbolic learning, relational learning, and to create things so that you can problem solve, you can imagine, you can do science, you can do art, you can tell stories. But if you disappear into them and if you have bad history that, that, that's given you constantly challenging stories, like how you're going to fail and disaster is going to happen, you're going to have another panic attack, you're not going to be able to function again, life's not worth living, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you want to back up a little bit and notice this language monster going. So that you have some choices in there that are dictated, that are structured by more than just your mind talking, just by this kind of Wizard of Oz voice within. So let me just mention a few to give people a sense of what they would learn if they sort of explored ACT in a more serious way through all the things that are there in the self-help books, websites, and all the rest, and therapy. We might teach people, let's say, if you, if you um, take that word milk, say it out loud. Just try this after the podcast. Say it out loud about once per second or a little bit faster for 30 seconds. And just notice what happens. Titchener was the first person to do it, father of American psychology, but we were the first to apply it clinically. And what happens is the white, creamy, cold, glug, glug, glug stuff disappears. It just disappears. I mean, and, and what you're left with pretty soon is just a sound, kind of a weird rah, 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 kind of sound and tiredness in your face, you know, because you realize when you say things over and over, it's actually a muscular thing, something we don't normally notice when we talk that it's actual effort, you know, that we're doing something because we say different things. And so the muscles recover. But when you say the same thing over and over again for 30 seconds, it's like, you know, lifting barbells towards the end. You can hardly even make your jaw move. And you, you kind of notice that you're talking. Well, that's not the same as white, creamy and cold. And I'm not saying that one's true and one's false. Sometimes you want to think about milk in the normal way. But sometimes you want to notice that you're just talking. And what if your mind gave you, what if your parent had given you, you ruined my life. I wish you'd never been born. You know, things are going well until you were born. I mean, children are being exposed to that over and over and over again. What do you think is going to show up in your mind when you're 20, 30, 70? There's no delete button in the nervous system. You're not going to forget it. Even if you did forget it, you can learn it more quickly. The second time showing that there's really no erasure once something's learned. Well, we teach people to do things like dig their self-critical thoughts down to a single word. Say it out loud about once per second for 30 seconds. Now, it doesn't erase the meaning, but it just reminds you that you're just talking. You're just thinking. And we have about 200 methods like that. I'll give you just a few more just to, to get the spirit of it. Good. And I'm gonna, I'll do one that sounds is a little dangerous, and then I'll do one that corrects the danger. Um, take a thought that really bothers you, pushes you around. Since this is a podcast having to do with anxiety, let's say anxiety-provoking thought. Uh, pick your least favorite politician, and I'll s say it in that person's voice. Or imagine it in that person's voice. Not to rid ridicule yourself, just to do it. If you don't like your least favorite politician, do it in the Donald Duck voice or Mickey Mouse voice. Or, you know, if uh, this meeting is going to be terrible, we'll just say it as, this will be terrible. <laughs> you know, the part of that, that, that that's dangerous is it sounds like ridicule, and you're not ridiculous. You're just a human being. The point of doing it is just to notice that you're talking. You're just right. talking and thinking. You know, the future is not here yet. 
And the thing I often put, I have a TEDx talk, people can Google it and find it. I've got two, and the second one is right on these skills. I ask people usually, how old are things like that? These worry, rumination, self-criticism, self-blame, shame. Almost always it goes back to when you're a kid. These things are usually not showing up first time when you're in your 30s. This is old stuff. Mm -hmm. So the final one, just to make sure that people know kind of what this is about, is to imagine yourself at that age, take some things that really are bothering you, that you torture yourself with now, these really scary, self-critical, self-judgmental, ruminative, worrying, etc. things, obsessive, you, you name it. And imagine yourself at that young age, as young as you can go when you first had any kind of anxiety issues, and have the child say it in his or her voice in front of you, those exact worries. And what would you do if you actually met a person that age saying things like, this is terrible, or I'll never be any good, or nobody loves me, or I'm going to fail, or life isn't worth living, or whatever it is. My guess is you're not going to slap them and say, what's the matter with you, you big crybaby? But you'll do that to the person in the mirror. You'll get up in the morning and look at yourself and just rip into yourself with such harshness and unkindness. So the purpose of the milk, milk, milk and the and the uh, least favorite politician and all the rest, scores, hundreds of these methods, is to dig down to something that's emotionally a little bit more like what would it be like to meet yourself as a young child saying the kind of things you easily say to yourself, which is to you know, kind of give yourself a get out of jail free card that you don't have to do what the Wizard of Oz voice in your set in your head is telling you to do. You don't have to actually get the Wicked Witch broomstick in order to get a, uh, you know, to be able to move on in your life. You can have that voice, use it when it's useful, and respectfully decline the invitation to get entangled with it when it's not. And the mindfulness and uh, skills that are now so in our culture help teach how to do that, uh, just backing up and watching thoughts instead of chasing them or grabbing them or holding on to them or pushing them away. Mm. Can That's I ask you a question? Of a set of skills. Yeah, I've gone on a little bit too long. No, so. I love it. So yeah. I had this really interesting experience the other day where I was driving to a Christmas party and my daughter said something about her neighbor, our neighbor. Yeah. And I was, I'm fairly confident in my mindfulness skills. And so what was interesting for me is it went from neighbor and then I thought neighborhood, I'm driving. And then yeah. I thought penis because of the word hood, right? Like from somehow my tracking of just my brain went neighbor to neighborhood to penis, right? Which right. if I had OCD, if I was a client of mine who had OCD, that thought because I have a, an ability to diffuse from that, I kind of laughed and thought it was hilarious that I'm on my way to a Christmas party thinking about penises. But if I know if I was one of my clients, that thought process would have been devastating to them because now they're thinking about penises and what does that mean about them? How, sure. would, you, how would you encourage them to diffuse in that situation when their brain associates yeah, these kind of relations and associations, and they're not just association. Association is something you have to actually directly connect together or it has to be similar to something. Mm. Relations don't have to be. Uh, this would take me into a geeky thing, so I'll just do <laughs> 30 seconds. But, you know, because the associative model suggests, boy, I, sh I shouldn't touch that because, uh, you know, I I'm getting more connected to it. I'm gonna but no, because if you are thinking like, oh, I can't think that. You just related to it again and wherever you went. So instead of think that, I'm going to think this. This is now a back door to that. So if it was like, oh, penis, oh, no, no, I'm not going to think. I'm going to think about sunset, 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 so, uh, beautiful sunset. So, well, the next time you see a sunset, guess what you're going to think about? And <laughs> so, you know, if I said something like hot, you know, most people are going to think cold. It doesn't matter if it's opposite. Opposite is still a relation. So the mind is a re is relational. That's, I think, 
when I'm dead and gone, if uh, if it goes the way I think it will, probably the most important thing I I brought into psychology is that. And um, because of that, if you do the math on these things, I, I've done it. If you just had eight things with eight different relations related to eight words, and all relations and all words and all things could be related in all possible ways, those eight t- trained things would yield 4,000 relations. Mm. If you have ever been on like 23andMe and stuff where they have all of your, your relations, I've done the math on this of you know how many different relations are implied by the uh, last time I went on 23andMe, the 1,423 people who are related to me and 23andMe. I actually did the math on it, and it was something like you needed 200 pages of zeros to express the number of relations. Well, how many things are in your head? More than 1,400. How many different ways could you relate them? You start doing the math, and it's like, well, more than molecules in the universe. Mm -hmm. It's just ridiculous. So the idea that you're going to control your thoughts, that you're going to have only nice, little, clean, sweet-smelling Oh, please, it's ridiculous. You've got this complicated, you know, spider web. We have black widows where I live here in Nevada, and their webs are this tangled, ridiculous-looking webs. The good thing you can avoid putting your hand in around black widows because they have very characteristic web. It doesn't look pretty at all. That's what our minds are like. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when you get in there and you start trying to rearrange the web, like, oh, my God, don't be thinking about penises. Oh, my God, what are we going to who? What would that mean? I must be some sort of perv. Oh, my God. Well, of course, what you're doing there is you're now, A, making that part of the web way more important. You're now weaving lots of little connections and relations. They're not, you know, sometimes there's is not a, there's, not, I don't want to, there's, but there's still relations. And it's not subtracting from the web. It's adding to the web and making it more important. So, you know, the thing I would say to people, if you learn how the mind works, is to think about your mind kind of the way you would if you had quarreling first graders, three or four of them sitting in your room right now. You probably don't want to get in there and trying to regulate that argument. If you've got to do that, A, you're not going to be able to do much of anything else. B, you're probably not going to win the argument. They're freaking four-year-olds, you know, they're just not, you know, they're, they're not going to be minding you very well. And even if you could get them to somehow, you know, be quiet for a moment, as soon as you're focusing on something else, they're going to start all up again. (laughs) So could we instead get some skills that will allow us just to step back just enough that we can hear the voices? And it's not even a single voice, it's the voices, some of which you might even know where it came from. A lot of which you don't, because it's just the spider web doing what it's doing. You know, when you're asleep, it's doing stuff. That, yeah, if you never awakened and suddenly you realize you've been dreaming about something and there's like some kind of connection that you didn't realize was there, these things have a life of their own. And that's what you're going to try to clean up, really. But if you, instead you could kind of view them the way you, you would in the common sense world, could we just back up? Notice what they're doing. If they're saying something important, if the kids over in the corner are screaming, I lit a fire, and then you look over there and there's fire and smoke, okay, then I'll do something about it. But otherwise, it'll be like, oh, okay, and now I've, I've got my computer in front of me. I've got some other things to do. Or I've got this podcast I'm doing. i got to talk to you. If you open up and just kind of look, there's a constant stream of these weak kind of relational connections. People who struggle with OCD isn't because they think odd thoughts. If I did thought records, you'd find people think about odd thoughts all the time. Hence my Christmas party story. Yeah. The difference is, is that when you are committed to not thinking odd thoughts, now you are in real trouble. Because what happens, this is true even the panic, by the way. Lots of people, even voices. Do you know how many people are walking around occasionally, even regularly, hear voices? You think it's just, not, you know, nobody could. No, that's not true. There's a lot of diversity out there. People are having odd thoughts. They're feeling funny bodily sensations. They're having emotions. They're even having odd perceptual experiences. That doesn't mean their life is going negatively until you do the logical, reasonable, sensible, pathological thing of trying to control what you don't need to control. 
If you're going to try to control that spider web, it'll take 24 seven and it'll get worse every moment because it's not controllable. And so instead, well, here's what you can't control. How much time and attention am I going to allocate to this? If it's yet another obsessive worry, thank your mind very much for doing that. I actually suggest naming your mind. Mind is named George. Helps a little bit. Name your mind. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. You got anything else to say? No? Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to focus on the road because I'm driving. Uh, penises are not of importance right now. Uh, <laughs> Not subtractively, not right. suppressively, no running, no fighting, no hiding, but gently redirecting your attention towards what's of importance. And I don't think of that as distraction. It's a traction. Thank you very much, mind. I've got more things to do than to try to clean up this spider web. Mm. And, you know, if you've got anything to tell me that's really important, go for it. Right. But meanwhile i got a life to live. And those skills can be taught of that little step back, diffusion, reallocating attention, connecting with what's at stake here that's values-based by choice, not by the mind just telling you you have to, no wagging fingers, no shame and blame, but just I care about this. You know, what I want my life to be about is in terms of qualities of actual action. Well, you tell me. I don't know what it is. Could be love, could be contribution, could be play, could be participation, could be creation, could be beauty, could be anything, could be many things. Well, how about if we allocate our attention towards what's possible in this next moment that's about that mm -hmm. instead of I can earn my right to live and breathe only when I subtract all of my worries and obsessions? Mm -hmm. Well, that will be never. Right. That's what you're saying. You'll say, right. I'll live my next lifetime. Well, that's a tragedy. This, your, your life is here now. And I'm not saying that out of criticism. You have to learn the skills. You can't just sort of do it on a dime. But they're not that hard. And, you know, we have pretty good randomized trials and all of that. It's not a panacea, but it's a pathway. And it's one that you can spend the rest of your life getting better at. I mean, the mindfulness and acceptance and values-based work isn't some, a one and done. Right. It's a practice and pattern of living. Right. I have a question about values. It's the, probably the most common question I get asked is when I talk with clients about values is they'll say, number one, either they've been so stuck that they don't even know what their values are anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Or that there's a conflict in that, and this is where I'd love to get sure. your thoughts, is that there's a conflict because they value certainty more than they value anything else in their life. So can okay. you speak to that? I can. The first thing that we need is to get clear on what values are and what they aren't. Values aren't just wants, preferences, wishes, desires. They're, nobody's going to give you the three magic wishes. That's not what a values conversation is about. Values are qualities of your actual living, qualities of being and doing. They're things that are intrinsic to behavior, to action itself, that you, by choice, not because you have to, not because mama's applauding, not because it's written down in a book, although you can, of course, take your values from your spiritual traditions, whatever, but it, all those spiritual traditions say it's bottom line, it's up to you. You're the one who has to make those choices. But between you and the person in the mirror, these are the qualities of my actual life moments that I hold dear. So something like certainty is not a quality of behavior. Certainty is a, a feeling maybe, or a, but if you can turn it into an adverb that can be put into an action by choice, those are the, or sometimes an adjective, but so for example, you can lovingly do things, you can creatively doing things, you can mindfully do things, you can genuinely do things, you can authentically do things, you can honestly do things, you can, those are all values. You can't, with a whole lot of money, do things. That's not a quality of a behavior. <laughs> it's a that's a result point. of a behavior. You can't, in a big house, do things. Yeah, you could do it in a big house, but that's not a quality of behavior. That's a thing. You can't with a really cool Cadillac. I mean, you know, the things people are pursuing with money and objects and materials and stuff, they will just mock you because even when you get them, if those qualities aren't there, it's an empty promise. So be careful, first thing, to not confuse, 
you know, this kind of mindy, you know, candy land wish that I was, you know, drinking sugar soup from morning till night, which frankly would be kind of a sickening diet. Uh, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. You know, but the mind's going to tell you that a smiley face button is an image of happiness. And then guess what? People you love die. Guess what? Tragedies happen. And you're not going to be present for that. I tell the story of getting on a plane and rushing down to watch my mother die. I knew she was dying when I got on the plane. She would had pneumonia for three days and made a really bad turn. She's 91 years old. That's why I rushed there. Was that sad? Yeah, that was sad. Was that bad? No, man, that was like sacred. But the, mind, the mind's so stupid. If I had to give you the choice between, I know I'm on a rant. I'll come back to your question. No, I'm enjoying it. If I too. gave you the choice between good and bad, and I said, okay, joy, which is it? You'd say good. Suppose I said sad, what would you say? You'd say bad. Suppose I said sad sitting by the bedside of my 91-year-old mother. That might slow you down. But the mind's so stupid, you know, that it'll actually tell you that, you know, these results it's grasping for or what you really care about. It's not true. So first, let's look at the qualities of being doing. Then how do you get there? Well, there's four quick ways and I can do it really fast. Mm. Who are your heroes, really? If you had to pick somebody as a guide, or somebody who empower you, stand with you, who are your heroes? That's one. Mm -hmm. We can unpack this in a second, Kim. I love it. Pick the sweetest moments you can think of in a particular domain. Pick the time when you felt especially uplifted, especially alive, especially connected, especially you, especially whole, especially, you know, cool. What it, take that moment. We all have them. What was inside that moment? Take the things that you struggle with the most, the things that are most painful, the moments in your life that really stabbed you through the heart. Flip them over and look at what that suggests you care about. And then the fourth one is, if you're writing your life as a story and you can't control the characters that will enter or the events that happen, but you can control the theme of the next chapter, what is it? So, you know, I, which is, so it's essentially authorship. So there are the four I know, heroes, sweet sad and authorship. But first, you need to be clear. We're talking about qualities of your action. We're not talking about what the physical or other social things might come from it. So if you want me to tell me that your value is getting married, I'd say, no, it isn't. Well, what do you want that for? Or your value is uh, having a job makes a lot of money and say, wait a minute, what are you going to do with that money? What are you going to do with having a job? What's the job about? What is it for? It has to be a quality of your actual behavior that we're talking about. That cleans up a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Now, this values conflict thing you talked about, there are very few that are real values conflicts. Usually these are like kind of conflicts between wishes and the Candyland version. But when they are real values conflicts, they're like this. I only have so many moments in my life and I can only be so many places in my life. And to which I say, that's right. Welcome to the human condition. And here's what we need to work on then. It's not a values conflict. This is the pain of finitude and of the fact that you don't get to control everything. So you may lovingly raise your children, for example, but that doesn't mean you get to choose whether or not they have an anxiety disorder. You're not them. That's not your choice. You may you know, really want to be a loving parent but that doesn't mean that you're going to not have to go to work. And while you're going to work, you're not going to be able to be there with your kids. That's painful. That's the pain of finitude. You're not a deity. You're not everywhere, always, for everybody, forever. You know, it, it's, and we imagine, you know, in our religious, spiritual traditions that there are beings that don't have that contradiction, but we have that limitation. So that's painful. Every parent feels it when they look at their kids and you feel it when you look at the TV and you see the starving children, and you want to write a check and you just wrote a check for the, the repair surgery and the people who have hair lips or for the, you know, the poor people in Africa or something. I mean, you're not going to be able to write a check to everybody. You only have so much money in the bank. That's the same basic issue. And that is not a values conflict. That's the pain of being human. Mm -hmm. 
And the only way out, out of that is not a way out. It's choosing what to be about in this moment and hoping that there's enough when we turn values loose in the human community that all of these things that you care about, people can actually care about as qualities of their behavior, that there are people who will write the checks for the people in Bangladesh while you write it for the people in Africa mm-hmm. and so on. You know, there's this kind of metaphor for it. Right. And is that true? I don't know, but let's find out. And right now we've got people running from their own values because they find when they remind themselves the reason why there's such a pause and they can't tell you what their values are is when you really remind yourself of what you care about what you deeply want those are the places where you've been hurt in the past those are the places where you're going to be hurt in the future and if you really want love and commitment those are those places where betrayal stabs you through the heart it only comes that way and If you really want to be there for your clients and find a way to put something into the suffering humanity, when one of your clients fails, you're going to go home hurting. You know, if one of your clients commits suicide, you're going to take a long time to get over that. That's the way it comes. So you can run from your values but to do it you have to run from your caring which means you run from your life if you're going to embrace your values it's no longer sugar soup life is a combination of sweet and sad of possibility and limitations of finitude and contribution so if you don't have any skills of opening up to that you're not going to be able to do the values conversation would you start with the acceptance piece yeah that's why it's When I said it's really six sides of a box, but it's one box, you can see how, take that example of emotional openness and deep caring by choice uh, connected to qualities of what you do. You know, I just said earlier, one way you get to values is take the things that really hurt and flip them over and look and see what does that suggest you care about? Well, what that tells you is that the very things people come to see, persons like yourself or myself, when I say, oh, you got to take this anxiety away. Oh, well, why? Oh, because, and, well, what would you do if it was taken away? Well, and sometimes there's a long pause. People haven't thought about that. And what do you really want? And you'll find that um, on the flip side of it is what you want. I'll give you an example. Uh, part of my anxiety struggles were always around people, of feeling inadequate and not up to the challenge. I gave a TED talk where I talk about turning in 180 directions towards my anxiety monsters. And then only a couple of years later, finding myself hiding under my bed at eight years old, listening to my mother and father scream at each other in a household that had uh, domestic uh, violence and addiction and depression and OCD in the hallways. I mean, that's how I was raised by very loving parents, but who had a really hard time taking care of themselves. Yeah. Well, I've never met a person who's socially anxious, who doesn't want to be with people. And what I found underneath my own panic disorder and social anxiety was things like the eight-year-old wanting to do something about the suffering he saw in his home, but not feeling up to the challenge. Yeah. When you're eight years old, you're not going to be able to save your parents. Yeah. So here I am as an adult now having panic attacks in in a workshop. Well, it's a very similar situation. I'm I'm there. I'm trying to contribute. I'm trying to do something and I don't feel adequate to the task. That's not my enemy. That's more like a, a lighthouse or a beacon. I mean, that anxiety helps me orient towards how deeply important it is for me to do something about people who are suffering. And that's in alliance with that suffering eight-year-old. Yeah? Mm. So what I'm saying is, is that um, acceptance and values are two sides of the same thing. If you're not open emotionally, you can't afford to care because caring leads to hurt. We saw this in our data. It's really kind of sad is that people who are emotionally avoidant, who run from anxiety, they run from joy too. Mm. 
the people who are listening to me right now, if you have a big anxiety struggle, I bet you, if you're socially anxious and somebody comes up to you and makes and gives you a really sincere compliment, man, is that hard to take. I mean, you want to deny it. You want to run for the hills. Why is that? Well, it's because if you're running from anxiety, you got to run from joy too. Right. I mean, what if you were to, to, you know, when you get invited to a party, you know, really, and you feel that little up? Yeah, but right behind it is what happens if I get anxious there? Well, that's the part of you that doesn't know how to feel. It isn't just that it doesn't know how to feel anxious. It doesn't know how to feel a joy and connection about being at a party either. Because if you were to open up to that, well, what would happen if then criticism happened or withdrawal? Uh, no, you don't get an invitation to the next party. What would happen if you made a mistake? What would happen if you showed yourself to be a fool? What would happen if you spilled everything all over yourself and people really didn't want you there? And they, You better not go to that party. Which is, of course, exactly what the socially anxious person will do. Mm-hmm. So you see, there's a deep connection between acceptance and values. They're kind of almost the same thing. Mm. Would you say acceptance is one of the first steps towards it, or would you say it's by both or vice versa? Well, acceptance I usually think of as a pretty high level skills because it's so close to values. And my usual self as a person dealing with anxiety, if you're dealing with drug addiction or something, you usually go hard on values first because you've already got this chemical things which are constantly forcing feel good into your body, you know, even if it's ruining your life. But for an anxious person, the place I usually go is to first admit how things are going. And if things are not going in a positive direction, and usually they're not, to just suspect that maybe it's because you're playing a losing game that your mind is put in front of you. In other words, that maybe you don't really need what your mind tells you you need, Mm. which are things like security and certainty and all of that. That's maybe just another face of the same anxiety monsters. That's first. Just start to trust your experience more and your mind less. Then the second thing is to begin to rein in the mind a little bit. Just mindfulness skills at all, not to eliminate the anxiety. Be careful. Mindfulness is another trick. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not some sort of tranquilizer. It's a way of showing up in the moment in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary in a way that's more emotionally and cognitively open. I would say the first place to go might be from there with diffusion skills. Learn to rein in the mind. It's not that hard to do to have some of those skills. It's a lifelong journey to be good at it, mind you. I mean, the Dalai Lama says he sometimes still gets mad. He's been meditating for how many decades? <laughs> I mean, so, you know, none of us are going to be superstars. Nobody's going to get the award as, you know, Mr. Mindfulness. But you can get a little more flexible, a little more open. And as that begins to happen, as you begin to come into the present moment in a way that's more open, now focus on your values because now you have a, a little more skills to take the scary possibility that you can actually live a life worth living. That's pretty scary. You don't want to go directly to there. <laughs> you know, give yourself a little bit of the mindfulness work, a little bit of openness, and then just move your... If I were able to really have my life be about what I want it to be about, not the sugar soup outcomes, but the qualities of being and doing, what would I want to put in my life? You know, what would I want people to see when they look at me? What would my guides say, my heroes say? What does my pain say? What would my sweet moments say? If I was writing the story, what would the theme be? And now then we're down to, okay, how would I put that into my life's moments? So, for example, let's say a person is really struggling with anxiety. They put life on hold. Let's say they've got social anxiety. They've got obsessive thoughts. Occasionally, they had some overwhelming periods of anxiety. They tend to back up. They're constantly making sure things are safe. They take their safety signals. They take their tranquilizers. They limit their life. They do all that kind of stuff. And then you decide we're going to turn in another direction. Well, first you admit, okay, that's actually not taking me in a positive direction. Enough of that. And if clients want to tell me, no, I need more of that. You need to help me just get rid of all the anxiety. I say, well, if your experience hasn't yet told you that's a fool's errand, maybe you need to go out and suffer a little more. Come back Mm -hmm. when you're ready. You know, if that works, great for it, go for it. You know, I'm not meaning to be judgmental when I say that, really. But if people are ready, you're like, okay, enough is enough. 
you know, then do a little bit of mindfulness work and reining in the mind work. And then uh, what would I do? Well, I don't know. Take a person who's socially anxious and let's say part of what I would want to do is if I was more flexible, I'd want to travel and meet some different kinds of people. I've always wanted to do that. Well, how could you create the possibility of doing things like could you travel just in the places where you live that are shorter trips? Can you, you know, agree to take some shorter trips? Can you set it up so that you can explore what it would be like to push out these boundaries of the cage that your mind put, told you you had to live in to be safe? And not as a way to defeat anxiety, but as a way to sort of as a declaration of independence of my life is my life, thank you very much. And one of the things I want to do is participate and communicate and play with people at different places and different cultures. If you do, I'm not I'm not saying that should be your value. I'm just saying if it was. Well, it doesn't take very much of that before you begin to realize that how big your life gets or the direction it has is really kind of up to you. It's not up to you as to what will be there. It's just like writing a story. You don't know what the characters and events are. You might go on a trip and, you know, somebody wants to hold you up with a gun or you might have a panic attack or, you know, you might get really ill or you might throw up on the, the person riding next to you in the plane or you may, I don't know. I'm mentioning a few things that are in my mind but back when I used to not travel because I was too afraid and would be I mean, throwing up on people. That was one of my obsessive fears. But back, you know, how many, 35 years ago? But you get to have this next period of your life be about kind of a hero's journey of how to put the qualities you want in your life into your life. And if we can get that far, if we've done it a few times, then it's a matter of building these habits out in a way that's not uh, self-aggrandizing and arrogant. I've learned never to say never. My last panic attack was in the mid-90s, and it had been a few years beforehand. And I was given a talk in front of, I think, 12 world-famous psychologists. And I hadn't prepared very well, and I'd been up much of the night, and blah, blah, blah. And I turned, and I'd get up there and, and suddenly almost fall down because I'm having a panic attack. So I've learned never to say never. I might have one right here, right now. And what people will hear from me is, bleh, bleh. But I'm not going to make that my problem. That will be your problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not saying it cavalierly. I know that would be hard on me if that actually happened. But okay. Your if it's hard, it's hard. And there's a place you can get to there where life just begins to be your therapist. And um, it's not very far away. I don't want to sound Pollyanna-ish, but... Uh, Moving in a direction of a life worth living is as far away as uh, the word now. That's beautiful. Well, I could literally chat with you for another day, but I know you have important things to do. I'm so grateful for you sharing your own experience and your brilliant mind with us. Can you tell us where people can find about you and your services and your work? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things is there's a lot of resources out there now in acceptance and commitment therapy uh, or ACT. And so and there's free things. There's a, a Yahoo group of ACT called ACT for the Public of several thousand folks who support each other. I read every single thing there. It's free. You can join it. I do have a website, Stephen C. Hayes, Stephen with a B, Middle Initial C, like in Charlie Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, Stephen C. Hayes dot com. If you do go there, what happens is you get on my list. I try not to spam you or only send out something all once a month. It's mostly just uh, clinical newsletters, things to think about, blogs, etc. But what people will get as soon as they go is there's a little seven-session mini course on ACT. It's just a series of weekly emails that are about a page or two long that just kind of walk through the psychological flexibility model. Maybe enough that you can get a sense of, is this something I really want to learn about? And at the point in which you're there, you know, things like self-help books and stuff. I've got one that is, you know, it's still reasonably popular called Get Out of Your Mind Into Your Life. You held it My up. My favorite kind. book. Yeah, you, you held, it, held it up kindly. We've actually done randomized trials on that. And if people read it, 
they actually get about 60% of what you get from a course of therapy in ACT, which is crazy given that it only costs about 12 bucks. But here, I can tell people how to read it if I take just a second. I'd love that. Skim it in a day. Don't do any of the exercises. Why? Because especially if you're struggling with anxiety or something, it's, it's kind of nice to know where you're going. So just skim it in a day. I mean, you know how to do a light reading so you kind of get a sense. Then put it away. Actually, don't even open it again for at least a day or two. And if there was something in there that connects or resonates, it's going to start whispering to you. You know, I'm down here on the shelf. You just will get a sense of maybe I should read that book. Really read it. And at that point, go back and read it slowly with care, doing all the exercises. If you hit one that you kind of get stopped at, either go to the Act for the Public Listserv and join it and ask questions about it, or just skip it and come back to it later. But try to do all of the exercises. And that's going to take you about a month. Mm -hmm. And if you do that by the end of the time, as I say, it's about, it's a big chunk. I mean, we've done randomized trials with uh, depression, anxiety, et cetera. It's of genuine help to people. And of course, if you see something in there and you, you need or want professional help, there's a whole lot of folks out there. And you can actually Google that if you put in a, a bit.ly link, you know, bit.ly forward slash, and then find with the word find with a capital F, an, A-N, not capitalized, ACT, A-C-T, all capitalized, therapist, not capitalized. Just find an ACT therapist, but capitalized the way you probably normally would, but with no spaces. And what that will take you to is the list of therapists at the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, about five or 6,000 people around the world. And you can put in almost any city in the world and somebody's around who might be of help to you. Mm, so good. And so that's interesting because I am drawn to the letting go chapter. Yeah. So is that what you're saying? Like if there's a chapter that's pulling you in, are you saying just wait until the whole book pulls you in? Well, what will happen is something when if you do the skim and set aside, the skim and set aside, there's more to you than just your judgmental mind. And, and when you touch things that are of importance, I trust people's sort of gut sense. You know, there's a gut sense that there's something in here that would be worthwhile to me. It may show up as kind of a sense of vulnerability or you're just coming back to mind. It may, it may stir things up almost subconsciously. You know, you find yourself waking up with a little bit of thought to it. But that's what I meant was just right. uh, if it speaks to you. Right. There are some people, you know, mindfulness is not for everybody. I mean, it probably is if everybody would do it, but everybody's not <laughs> going to do it. Everybody's yeah. not going to do it. So I don't know. I mean, let's, I'm not, I would rather not be so certain about what's helpful for people, right. but give it a try. And if there's a sense in there that, no, there's something in there that's really worth exploring, well, then, then explore it seriously. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, I found that a reliable guide. People, when they have that little gut sense of connection, it predicts positive outcomes. Mm. There's something in here that your gut knows is important. I love that. I really appreciate you mentioning that. I mean, I'm biased. I'm going to say everybody needs to read the book, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm cool with that. (laughs) Well, Well, I'm happy to have everybody read the book. Oh, I love it. You know, self-determination is important. So even that, let's hold that a little lightly. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good thing in randomized trial, but You know, we did one with, uh, I know I'm going on, but just 30 seconds with people who are even severely depressed at the same point that would take them into an inpatient facility. And about 60% of them, by the end of the time of reading it, had gone out of the clinical range. So that's kind of crazy, you know, that maybe even books and apps and free websites and all that, maybe we can help each other Mm. create modern minds for this very difficult modern world that we've created with our minds and uh, sort of have our cake and eat it too. We'll have our iPhones and we don't have to, you know, drown in horror judgment and comparison. Right, right. Every iPhone should come with get out of your mind and into your life. (laughs) (laughs) Like yeah. it just it comes as a part of the packaging. Yeah, it's part of the pack. 
I love it. Well, thank you so much. This has just been such a joy for me. And I know the listeners have been really excited about this as I shared it with them. Thank you. I'll have all of the links in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to mention before we finish up? I'd just say, um, you know, you're not alone. If you're struggling with these kinds of things, you're not alone. And, you know, been there, been there. Check out my TED Talks if you want a quick connection with who I am and that history. But, uh, you know, science can help you and um, you don't have to suffer alone. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.